Um, okay, let's start. Uh, Dan is away. Um, I'm one of Dan's students, and I'm teaching the lecture today. Um, the discussion today is about neural networks. Um, before I start, how many people have heard about neural networks? Hmm? Neural networks. Um, OK, that's a big number. How many people know how neural networks actually work? OK, I guess that's OK. One person knows. Good. Uh, <clears throat> so, so far during the course, what we have learned is that we have studied linear classifier extensively. You have learned about perceptron algorithm. You have learned about online learning. I believe that you have learned about SVMs too. Am I right? Not yet. You will, you will learn about SVMs. And basically, all of, in all of those scenarios, the assumption was that the data set or the target problem that you're dealing with is linearly separable. Okay, so basically, you can use a hyperplane to separate the classes that you're interested in. But what if that's not the case? For example, in this case, this is a very simple problem. It's one dimensional axis. One class is this red dots. The other, ax the, the other class is uh, the blue dots. It's clear that we cannot separate them using a linear classifier. Right? One alternative is to use a nonlinearity. Right? So let's say we use this function here. In this case, it works. But the question is, is this function going to work for other problems? Right? So I think that our answer is going to be no, because this is not a general function. Right? One approach that we studied in order to deal with these kind of issues is to blow up the data. By using kernels, you studied about kernels. Kernels were the nonlinearities that take the data to high dimensional space in which the hope is to be able to separate the data uh, with a linear classifier. Right? So in this case, we, uh, we add an extra dimension of x squared. And in this space, we can see that this is now linearly separable. Right? But this problem was easy because we already knew something about the properties of this data set. Right? So the question is, how can we find a slightly more general answer for these kind of problems, right? So the data set, the problem is a lot of natural data, they're not linearly separable, right? And kernels sometimes work if you know what kind of nonlinearity you need for your data. But if you don't need it, if you don't know much about the data, you have to come up with a, with a system, with a function, with a class of functions that are able to express nonlinearities, right? And that is what neural networks are about, right? So in this, in this lecture, we are going to learn about this specific fam family of neural networks. Namely, they're called multilayer neural net networks or multilayer perceptrons. And the idea is very simple. Basically, we are going to stack simple functions on top of each other. And by stack, I'm referring to function composition. You have a function here. You find, you give an input, you calculate this output, you take the output, give it to another function, and you keep doing this until you get to the final output, right? So this is my input. Ooh. Oh, this is my input. I have hidden layer here. I can have more hidden layers, so I'm only showing one, until I get to the output, right? And I'm going to refer to each of these dots here, a unit. The, a unit is a function, a function which takes in a bunch of inputs and calculates an output, and we connect the output to the next layer. Right? So this is what we call a multilayer perceptron. And uh, really, it's, a, it's all about rep being able to represent lots of lots of nonlinear functions. Right? So we are creating a family of, not just one, a family of nonlinear functions. And, and we are going to be, we are going to try to uh, deform the param we are going to be able we are going to try to update, train the parameters of this system so that we can fit this for our target problem. So let's try to make it slightly more formal. Neural networks is a function. It's a mapping from input to output. Your input can be categorical. It can be continuous. And the output is either binary or a bunch of categories. Right? 
And uh, what we are going to see that, or what we have seen empirically, is that it's a relatively uh, robust solution to lots of problems, even if you don't know much about uh, the nature of how the classes, how the data is distributed. Um, and what we are going to see, um, we are going to read about this algorithm called backpropagation that we are going to use in order to train this model. Backpropagation um, is widely used now in computer science, especially in AI. So um, if, you're, if you're graduating with a bachelor's degree from, from University of Pennsylvania, this is one of the algorithms that you should know. Otherwise. Uh, it's going to come up in one of the interviews. So this is the algorithm that you're going to learn about today. It's slightly involved. Uh, the details of this algorithm is a little mathy, and it might hurt. But we are going to focus on the intuition, so that even if you forget some of the details, we can, you can always look it up. What matters is what I want us to take from this lecture is the high-level idea, the intuition. Right? Let's all focus on the intuition. And let me just remind you that at any point you feel that something is unclear, please do ask. Right? Don't wait for it. If, if you have a question, probably someone else has the same question. Right? Interrupt me. Um, so neural networks, uh, they have a long history. They're, they were initially inspired by biological systems, the neural system in our brain. In fact, the first people who started to study these structures, they were neuroscientists, psychologists. And um, basically, the idea is that you have, we have this neural system in our brain. They have their small units that we call, or neuroscientists, they call neurons. They're connected to each other. They fire, and, and the outputs propagate throughout our body. Right? So that's the idea. And we are trying to create, to create a mathematical formalism for the same idea. But um, I have to say that, take that description with a grain of salt because there are lots of lots of differences between what we have in our brain and what we actually implement in reality in computers. There are many differences. For example, uh, the number of the neurons that you have in your body is much bigger than what we can visibly implement in computers. Vast difference, right? There are other differences too. For example, in our brain, uh, neurons are actually very, very slow. Their power comes from huge amounts of parallelization, right? So when, when I, let's say, when I touch a wall and I feel it, it's actually not that fast. What makes it really powerful is all this parallelization that helps me sense or react to some form of sensory information, right? On the other hand, in computers, things are fast, but it's really hard to parallelize things, right? So um, the technology that we are going to learn about, they existed, um, they've, they've been there for the past 20 years. What has made them really popular, especially in the past five or so years, is, um, is the new ideas that we got in order to how to leverage this nonlinearity. For example, we have more data now. We have higher, higher speed computations. We, we know better how to use parallel uh, computation now. And all of these ideas have given new intuition as to how we can um, leverage the power and expressiv expressivity of neural networks. Okay, so basically, again, just to mention, just to re repeat this, the technology that we are reading, um, this has existed for the past 20 years. Now, now what we have and what is new is new intuition, new data, new computational power, right? Let's get deeper into what, are, what is a neural network, right? So, I've, so far, we have defined that I have this stacks of units. Each unit takes in computation, the inputs of the previous layer, and feeds into the next layer. Now the question is, what are these units? How are we going to define them? Uh, one of the initial efforts, or the way people tried to approach it, was something that was very similar to how human brain does. Basically, apparently, what's happening in our brain cells, in our neurons, is uh, a unit, a neural unit, they take in an input, and if the value that they receive is above a threshold, they fire it to the next layer, right? 
So there's this like heart thresholding unit here, which acts as a unit. So basically there's this imp collection of inputs, we represent them this way, they're weighted, we sum them, we give the summation to a threshold unit, right? if, if it is above a threshold, we fire something, otherwise it's zero, and this is the output, right? So that, that was, that was uh, the initial, one of the initial ideas, maybe we should do this, right? Um, we are actually not gonna do this because there are computational issues with this. And instead, we are gonna try to use a model or a, a function here, this, I'm referring to this function. We're gonna try to use a threshold function that is continuous and it is differentiable. <clears throat> any, any thoughts on why we are gonna do that and not this function? Yes? Why is the original not differentiable? Uh, why is the original function not differentiable? Um, <clears throat> Oh, where are you going from? Oh, here. Okay. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. So let's say I have this. <clears throat> this is to the axis, right? So this is y. This is x. And if my function is is a constant. Um, this is this has a trivial differentiation, right? So this is zero gradient everywhere. Uh, but let's say I define this, this for two different constants. Um, basically, Uh, there is, this part is differentiable, this part is differentiable. This part, the, 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 the point where we are separating these two, in this case it's zero, it's not differentiable. It is partially differentiable, it's not differentiable for, um, but we will get back to this, why that's a problem, right? So we are gonna try to use an algorithm that's, uh, we, so far we have learned that you have seen class of algorithms that use gradient descent in order to train a model, right? Gradient, in order to calculate gradient, we need to differentiate a function. And we are gonna see a, an algorithm, namely backpropagation, which uses gradient descent, or a version of gradient descent, which needs differentiability in order to be able to be trained, right? That's the requirement. So instead of this function, we are gonna do this function, right? So I'm, I'm basically creating a smooth version of that. The input is summation of uh, we have the summation of inputs, we give it to this nonlinear function, and we, take, we get the output, and that is what we are gonna use as a unit, right? Let me emphasize that uh, we are gonna use a specific definition of this nonlinearity here. Uh, we are not restricted to that. So basically you can use, you can define your own nonlinear function, and as long as you're able to calculate its gradients, and hopefully it's, a, it's gonna be a simple gradient, you should be able to use it here and that should be good enough for you, right? So we are gonna fix the definition in order to der derive our outputs, but you're not restricted to that, right? To keep it more formal, uh, let's define my inputs uh, a bunch of xi's. Uh, there are a bunch of weights that I have to multiply by this xi in order to, uh, so my, I'm calling the index of the output is j, wij's are basically all the weights that I have to multiply by my inputs in order to calculate the summation and this is my nonlinear function. I basically, I pass this, non, this, cal, this summation to this nonlinear function in order to get this output that I have here, right? Are we good so far? Yes. Uh, you had a question? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so I'm referring, I'm, J is, so let's say these are our inputs. Okay, let's go back, okay. Let's say this is J. And I want to calculate the output here, right? In the output of this unit. I have, what I have here is a bunch of inputs fed into this unit, right? So this is that unit, J, and these are the bunch of inputs that are fed into that unit, right? I'm gonna sum them, and I'm gonna run them through a nonlinear function, and the output is gonna be the output of the unit, J, 
a little bit of history. This idea, uh, as I mentioned, it came from, from neuroscience. There were, uh, there were two neuroscientists, uh, McCulloch and Pitt. Uh, their goal was to show that they, were, they hypothesized that human brain is doing something similar to Boolean functions, right? So, and or conjunction disjunctions. And they said, all right, we are gonna create a computational model of neurons, and we are gonna show that indeed these neurons can actually simulate Boolean functions. That's what they did. They showed that a two-layer neural network can actually simulate a lot, basically any, neural, any, any Boolean function that you have, it can simulate, it can express them, right? So that was one of the first ideas that we got. And later on, mathematicians studied the expressivity, expressivity of neural networks that they show that they're global approximators in the sense that, for example, any bounded continuous function can be approximated by uh, a two-layer uh, two neural network. In fact, there are more general terms which show any function, any function can be approximated by a three neural network. Um, okay, so let's try to check how much we know so far, right? Let's test ourselves with a quick quiz, right? Question, um, give it a neural network. So this is our neural network. We have input, we have three hidden layers. Uh, the question is, how can we make a prediction? Let's say I give you a neural network. Uh, what is it that I call a prediction, right? So by, pre by prediction, I'm referring to this. I give you an input. And there's a neural network is given to you, right? How do I calculate the output given input? Yes. Let's repeat. Let's try again. I, I think you explained it right, but I feel like it was very complicated with that. Okay, can, can someone give a second try? Yeah, yeah, can you like express it like by, you know, based on layers, like first we take, so let's just start with the input layer. Okay, we have the input. Uh, your explanation was uh, accurate. Uh, let me just correct this part. Uh, we, uh, we, as I mentioned, we are using this continuous activation function. So basically, you always fire something. Sometimes it's big, sometimes it's small, right? So it's continuous uh, nonlinearity. Um, and your basically, his explanation was accurate. Let me just try to repeat that. There is an input. It's given to us. Given this input. We calculate the output of the second layer. Basically, second output of second layer is a bunch of summation, linear summations, nonlinearities, and we keep on doing this until we get to the output at which at which is that we already have the output, right? So that's that's how it works. Questions on this? This is like this is this is a very fundamental step in order to move on with the rest of the slides. If you have questions on this, if it is not clear, this is the uh, right time to ask. Oh, so in this case, uh, I'm assuming that I have my desired output is actually two variables, right? Let's say let's say your output is uh, tell me 
what is the age of this person and tell me whether this is a this is adult or not, right? Two outputs. Uh, are we talking about this? Oh, this is upside down, sorry. <laughs> so this is input, this is output, sorry. Okay. My apologies. <laughs> okay, great. Oh, that's a great point, sorry, I, I didn't explain it. That's just the threshold function, that's just the, sorry, that's just the constant to shift the function, to shift this function to the right or left. But for this lecture, we can basically ignore it. It's just the constant, which we are gonna fold into the parameters. We are gonna train that during the updates too. Um, but I, I think for the rest of the lectures, we can just assume that that's a constant. Okay, next question. Uh, what is required to fully specify a neural network, right? So let's say I tell you that, let's say you have a neural network and your colleague asks you, hey, uh, can you pass that neural network to me? I want to run it on my images. What is it that you need in order to specify your neural network? Yes? How the neurons are connected and what weight the neuron has for the um, Exactly, let me repeat the answer. So he says, in order to specify a neural network, you first have to be able to express, explain the architecture, how many layers, how many widths, how many units, right? What kind of units, what kind of nonlinearities. The other thing that you need is the weights that are connecting these units to each other, right? So the connection weights, right? These two. Was that clear? Next question. Well, here I, I only mention weights because um, if, some, if something is not connected, uh, it, you can always assign weights here. Uh, why neural network predictions can be quick? Right? So like a lot of people say that, oh yeah, neural networks are quite fast. Why do you think uh, they, why, why do you think, wh what do you think makes them really fast? Just make a guess. Yes. Exactly, beautiful. Um, this, is, this, this, can be, this is a very easy um, interview question. So a lot of these computations that we have, um, a lot of these calculations, you can parallelize them because you have so many units in the same layer, they're working parallel, you can parallelize them. This is a very key engineering, engineering intuition. Thanks for the answer. Oh, and final question. Um, what makes neural network a non what part of this architecture makes it nonlinear? Like, what is, where does the nonlinearity non come from? Yes. Oh, sorry, you asked. Uh, but having, so your answer was having multiple layers. Is that enough? Like, is it true that any multi layered system architecture? Is going to be able to, is going to be necessarily a nonlinear approximator. No. We'll get back to you. Thank you. Yeah, that's the key. So basically, uh, nonlinearity is coming from the activation functions that you have defined in each of these units. Uh, if the activation function is linear, some of these some of these Linears, they're going to be linear overall. Right? So you can collapse them into a one linear function. Right? So the key power is two things, as you mentioned, layers and the activation fu functions being nonlinear. Right? Okay, cool. Um, now we are going to move on. Now, now we know how to specify a neural network given those parameters. And we know how to calculate a forward computation given input, how I can calculate the output. The question is now you give me a training data a bunch of input output observations. How am I gonna be able to train this system, right? Uh, a little bit of history on, the, on training systems, training neural systems. Um, again, history, again, we're gonna start from uh, psychology and neuroscience. neuroscience. Uh, there was a scientist, uh, Hebb, uh, this is a famous update rule. He basically says that if you have two neurons and there is a weight connecting these two neurons, um, the weight should be bigger if these two tend to fire similar to each other, right? This is his update rule. 
Uh, this is the thing that he came up with. But later on, we discovered that, oh gosh, this is in fact gradient descent. This is very similar. In parallel, there was this guy, Rosenblatt. He discovered that he came up with something that is very similar to perceptron, right? Again, this was this turned out, you have learned about perceptron. Right? Again, this turned out to be very similar to what we find from gradient descent, right? Um, um, this is just a reminder about perceptron, but I'm going to move on since you already know what perceptron is. Um, and moving on to gradient descent. So the idea is that you're going to define this global objective function, a loss function in this case, that we are going to try to optimize, we are going to try to change our weights so that we gradually, over time, over the iterations, we minimize this loss function, right? So let's say I define this loss function here. And I start with some collection of initial weights. These are the weights of my neural network. I'm going to slightly perturb them until they minimize my loss function. And that's how I'm going to minimize my, that's how I'm going to optimize my neural network. Right? So over time, optimizing until I get to the minimum. And in order to do this optimization, I need gradients, right? Because gradients show the direction of maximal change, right? And in order to calculate gradients, I need differentiability in my function. Going back to what we discussed earlier, that's why we need these activation functions to be differentiable and not uh, without sudden changes, no threshold function, right? So how do we define, uh, the, how do we define this, up, this error function that we have here? What function are we gonna minimize? In this case, this is the function that we are, uh, we are targeting. Right? So for each of my outputs, let's say I, there's a gold label, gold prediction, basically this is the ground truth. Uh, the difference between these is what I want to minimize. I'm gonna find the square, I'm gonna find, uh, the, I'm gonna uh, find, the, this is the, the, to the power of, basically this, this makes it positive, right? So I'm gonna find this to the power of two um, because I only care about the absolute value. And I'm going to try to sum them over all the output variables and all the data, right? This is the fun, this is, and this is, a, this is a parameter of my weights, right? And I'm going to find the, the differentiation of this function with respect to each of the weights that I have in my model. And I'm going to try to change my weights, weights with respect to this differentiation, this gradient, right? Right? Um, Okay, so the, now the question is, uh, how are we gonna derive this uh, training algorithm? So for the final layer, if you, think, if you fix everything and if only think about the weights of the final layer, it's a linear model, right? So, and we have seen how we can update a linear model. So for the final layer, everything is easy. The key is how we are gonna optimize the weights that are uh, the weights before the final layer, right? These are the hardest ones. These are actually easy ones, right? Um, so the key is to use, um, of course, you are going to use math, and the key is to use a chain rule in order to calculate gradients in the layers before the final layer. So we are going to calculate the gradients or errors in this layer. We are going to calculate the gradients in, for the previous layers, and we are going to try to use the chain rule in order to propagate these errors to the previous layers and the layers before those. Right? So that's the high-level intuition. Right, so uh, let me remind you about chain rule. Let's first set the notation. Uh, this notation uh, shows that z is a function uh, independent on y, right? And what we want is to calculate, so again, this notation, this arrow here shows that there, z is a function, a function of y. And what we want to calculate is a differentiation of z with respect to y, right? This is what this notation shows, right? Now let's say we are in the setting, so we, there's a function z, it's dependent on y, and y is dependent on x, right? And what we want is differentiation of z with respect to x, the input variable, right? That chain rule tells us that I can chain these two differentiation next to each other, right? That's the chain rule. I can actually extend this, so, okay, how are we gonna use this? We're gonna use it in this way. I'm gonna, I have my error in the output layer, I'm gonna use the chain rule in order to calculate the errors or updates in each layer, the weights of each layer. That's how we are gonna use it. I can extend that rule in this way, in the sense that if I have two intermediate functions, this chaining actually uh, uh, distributes into some of the uh, chains. So I have a gradient, 
from this path and I have gradient from this path. I can extend it to many sums in this way. Right? This is the chain rule that you should know from analysis courses in, um, before this course. So, okay, so there are three key intuitions that you need in order to understand um, backpropagation. Even if you don't understand the rest of this lecture, this is, I would say, try to understand this slide and you're, you basically, you will be able to explain backpropagation in plain English. Gradient descent, first thing. Basically, we are gonna define error function as I, I, as I showed earlier, and we are gonna try to minimize that error function and find the optimal weights for our neural network. Right, so this is, what happened? Oh. Second rule, um, chain rule. I'm gonna use the chain rule in order to uh, find gradients at each of the intermediate layers, right? So this is my neural net. I'm gonna calculate error here, use the chain rule in order to calculate the error, the, the, the gradient of error with respect to all the weights in each of these layers, right? So for example, gradient with respect to this weight. Second, second idea is uh, dynamic programming or memoization. For those who have computer science back, background, Memoization is this idea that sometimes after calculating something, we can write it down and reuse it later in the future instead of recalculating it, right? So we are gonna use this idea in a calculation of that propagation to speed it up. I basically, let's say I want to find, let's say I start from here, I can calculate the gradient here and update my weights. Next time that I want to come here and update my weights here, I'm not gonna recalculate all the gradients here. I'm gonna use the weights or the gradients that are already written and saved on disk, memoized on disk, and in order to speed up my backpropagation, right? So these are the three key intuitions that you need in order to understand what backpropagation is, right? And um, all these, they all result in basically the back step of backpropagation. And let me show you a different intuition. So I'm gonna describe a high level intuition of what backpropagation is. There are two steps, the forward step and the backward step. The forward step is what our friend described a few minutes earlier. What he described is, given an input, I'm gonna calculate the output in the output of after each unit, right? This is my forward step. Given input, I calculate output after each in the output of each unit. The backward step is based on, uh, I'm gonna first calculate my error in the output, and I'm gonna try to calculate the gradient of the error with respect to each weight. This is my backward step. And using these gradients, I'm gonna update my weights, and the next time that I want to calculate my, out, my forward step, I'm gonna use the updated weights. Okay, so this is back propagation algorithm in a really high level. Uh, question about this. Um, can someone try to, in plain, in, in plain English, try to explain what back propagation is? Like I wanna make sure that we are all on the same page. Yes. Um, cool, uh, I, I feel like you already knew. You're too good. Uh, one more percent. If, especially if you think that you don't understand part of it. A brave person. All right, no volunteers? Yes. Yeah. Uh, can you repeat your question slightly louder so that everyone can hear? My question is how we calculate the power of the factor. Okay, yeah. Uh, so we haven't, I haven't shown you how, how we are gonna calculate. So the idea is that we are gonna calculate these gradients, right? I haven't shown you how we are gonna calculate that gradient. We will, I will show you if we have time. And so the idea is that if we calculate this gradient, 
I can always, so basically I'm gonna update my weights proportional to this gradient. Why is that a good thing? So the intuition comes from gradient descent. Gradient descent says, if you wanna optimize your function, let's say in this case, my optimization is over error function, I can move in the direction of gradients. Gradients with respect to my parameters, right? If I change my weights with respect to this, over time, this is gonna optimize my function with respect to, it's gonna optimize my error function. Is that intuition clear? Because the risk is basically that. It's, it's additive. Um, depending on whether you're maximizing or minimizing, it's gonna be addition or uh, uh, difference. Um, how is it decided how, how many units there are in each layer? That's a great question. Uh, it, it's, but it's a tricky one. So it really depends on your problem. Um, we don't actually understand. So, well, obviously, the more layers you have and the fatter your models are, your model is gonna be more expressive but it's gonna be, uh, it, might be, it might become too expressive, in which case it might overfit your problem. And in terms of computation, the bigger the model is, it's gonna be slower, right? So it's a compromise between how, expressive, how much expressivity you need and um, how much computational units you have and um, it's, it's a, it has to be decided by the domain expert. Okay, so um, another quiz time. Okay, what is the, uh, we're gonna repeat everything now. What is the purpose of the forward step? <coughs> Someone quick. What is the purpose of the forward step? Uh, oh, it's already shows, to make predictions, great. <laughs> What's the purpose of backward step? How we want to update the previous layer. Thank you. Uh, why do we use the chain rule? Differentiation. Um, uh, why backpropagation back could be very efficient or fast? Parallelization, thank you. Um, okay, now we are gonna drive the update rules and by update rules I'm referring to calculation of the gradients. Right? So this part is gonna be mathy if you fall asleep it's fine, but I hope you, you, you focus on the big picture, right? So uh, going back to the definition that we had, this is how you define the unit. So basically a, a linear summation of the input. Let's define this notation net j to be the summation of a bunch of inputs, they're weighted, and we are gonna use, uh, put the summation in a nonlinear function to calculate one output, right? This is the each unit. And uh, so the parameters that we want to update uh, here in this definition are my weights and this threshold here, which is constant, right? Um, right? So we are gonna need three gradients and we are gonna calculate them first and we are gonna reuse it, right? Just to keep things slightly simpler, we are gonna use color coding. Uh, blue is always this uh, output O, weights are always red. So the first function that we're gonna minimize is this error in the output, right? And I want to find the gradient of this uh, error with respect to all the predictions. This gradient is, um, you can check, it's gonna be this. Second function is weighted sum of the inputs, net j, and I want to find the gradient with respect to w's. It's gonna be this, you can verify it. Function three is this nonlinearity function, it's a softmax function. And I want to calculate the gradient of OI with respect to net J, right? So this is gonna be this function, right? Try to memorize these because we're just gonna re uh, reuse them. Yes? Um, this PK here, the like, true value. Oh, TK. TK, thanks for the reminder. Um, this is the gold output, right? So that's my desired output. O is what I predict, T is what I desire to, my, what I desire my, my model to have. And their difference is what I want to minimize. Okay. And then the K is all the different outputs for each. Excellent, yes. 
One more question. Okay. So um, first chain rule. So we have this uh, error function here, uh, this function here, and we want to minimize this. I want to find the differentiation. Well, I want to find gradient of this with respect to Ws because Ws are my parameters. But there is no W here, right? But I know that O is related to net, which is dependent on Ws, right? So I have this three-layer dependence on Ws. And I'm going to use the chain rule in order to find gradients of error with respect to Ws. So I'm going to find gradient of this with respect to O, gradient of O with respect to net, J, and gradient of net J with respect to Ws, right? So this is chain rule. Is this clear? Given this, which I got from chain rule, I'm going to. So what? Where are the three layers in the application? Um, forget about this. Forget about this. So we have this error function. This is defined based on a bunch of O's, output predictions. Each prediction is result of a nonlinearity. And the input to each nonlinearity is a summation of, is a weighted sum of a bunch of inputs, right? And I want to find, what I want to find is error, gradient of error with respect to my parameters, because parameters is what, because I, because I specify my, my neural network with a bunch of parameters, right? So I want this, but this doesn't have Ws, so I can use chain rule in order to chunk, in, in order to split it into gradients that I know. Right, so I, I know how to calculate this gradient because E is defined based on O. I know how to define calculate this because O is defined based on net J, and I know how to calculate this because net J is defined based on Ws. So we have this, and I'm going to just replace the definitions that we had from the previous slide. This part I'm showing how they correspond to each of the gradients. This is how we got this. The second part. This is how we calculated it, and this is the final part, right? This is how we calculated, right? So as you can see, so what we have cal calculated so far is the gradient of this output with respect to any of the weights in the final layer, right? And that was easy, right? This is, this is how we can calculate the gradients. I'm going to define this notation delta, I'm, and, and this not we are using, we are defining these deltas, and we are going to try to remember them when we are implementing the algorithm, because in the, when we go down, we go one layer down, I can reuse the deltas that I have calculated in the previous layer in order to just do the computations for the next layer. So the deltas are what I'm going to write it down in my disk, in my hard disk, and I'm going to save, and I'm going to reuse them for calculation of the next step. Right. And let's now think about the calculation of the gradient with respect to one of the weights in this layer. Not the final layer, but the, with respect to one hidden layer before the final layer, right? One before the final, right? Let's say this is my i and j, and this output is k. Basically, let's, let's, let's use k in order to describe any of the outputs in the, any of the units in the output here and let's use i in order to denote any of the nodes in the input layer, and j is this fixed node. And I want to find gradient of my error with respect to one of these edges here. Um, one intuition you should have now is that changing this weight is gonna change predictions of all the edges that are output, that are flowing out from that unit, right? So if I'm finding the gradient of the output with respect to this edge or this weight, I should have all the weights of these, uh, these edges in that update rule, right? Uh, so I, again, I'm going to use the chain rule. The first idea is to use, uh, uh, I'm going to, so I want this gradient, I want gradient of error with respect to wij, this edge, and I'm going to split it into two, um, two parts first. Right, so I want to calculate the gradient with respect to sum of weights, linear sum of the inputs in, in the input of the unit j, which, and then times the gradient of the net j with respect to this weight. I can replace, I can replace this part with this j because based, based on the definition, this part is trivial. And I'm gonna write this gradient, this part might be a little confusing, I'm gonna write this gradient as the sum of uh, gradients 
that are expressed based on the input, the sum of the weights in the input of any of the units um, in the layer after this. So parents, parents is a notation. Let me find what parents is. So basically, if I have a unit here, anything that flows out of this unit is considered the parent of this unit. So parents of J refers to all of these units. And, this, and we are writing this this way. This is, again, the chain rule. Uh, we are writing it this form because the effect of changing this weight is going to affect the output of all the output units connected to that unit, right? Chain rule. And I'm going to this parameter. This parameter. This parameter was what we calculated in the previous slide, delta k, for any of the deltas for this previous layer, and. The only thing that remains now is calculating this part, the gradients of two nets, one from this layer, one from this layer. And I can do that again with chain rule, and you can verify that uh, this is how it chains, like, how it expands like this, and how gradients correspond to each other. Right? And again, I'm going to define a new delta. Delta is what I'm going to remember, and I'm going to reuse it for the next layer. And this is the final algorithm for, uh, for backpropagation. Let, let's try to take a look at it and see how it corresponds to what we defined initially, right? So I'm going to loop over my instances. I'm going to loop over my instances for any of the examples in my training data. First, I'm going to do forward calculations. Compute the network output for this example. This is my forward step. Then I'm going to start from the output. I'm going to calculate the deltas. Deltas are what I, what I wanted to save in order to compute the gradients. I'm going to compute the delta in the final layer. Then I'm going to use these deltas in order to compute, compute the deltas in the previous layers. And using deltas, I'm going to compute my delta, delta w's, basically the amount that I want to change my weights. And using these delta w's, I'm going to update my weights. And I'm going to loop over all the instances in my training set. This is backpropagation. Ah, questions at this point? What is XR? What is I and XR? Oh. Um, uh, so I, we, I use index I in order to refer to one particular node in the network. Um, so in this case, let's see where is I here. Oh, so let's say for each hidden unit, um, so Wij is the weight that connects node I to J. Xi is one of the inputs that is fed into unit I. Right, so maybe, yeah, we should be clear about that. OK, so again, back propagation. Uh, if you didn't get the details, for, focus on the high-level intuition. The idea is we have this architecture. Given input, we are going to calculate the output. This is a forward step. Given this error in the output, I'm going to calculate the errors or deltas for my Ws, and I'm going to update all of my weights. This is the back propagation. And let me show you demo, because I think demo usually helps. Um, <clears throat> OK. First, let's just start simple. We have a linear classifier. This is my target problem. So I have this set of orange, uh, orange dots, and I have this circle of like blue dots, and I want to be able to separate them. If I have a linear, so one of my ax one axis is x1 and then x2. If I have a linear classifier, uh, my linear classifier trivially is going to suffer, right? So if I train a linear classifier. Uh, this is how my linear classifier separates them. It's not able to separate. But let's say I add two hidden layers here, and I train the model again. Again, suffers. Uh, let's add more hidden layers. Ah, it worked. Okay, so I added more and more nonlinearities, and it managed to fit the data. Right. Let's say I choose a different problem. Um, let's say this problem. The, and this is the, the, what this, this is the error 
uh, this is the error function that you're minimizing over time, over iterations. This is what we wanted to optimize. Um, the, the iterations, basically what happens at each iteration is that I take one of the training instances, make a prediction, calculate the gradients, come back, update the weights of my neural network, make another prediction. This is how, and this is how we are iterating over the training data. Uh, now, hey, let's, let's, uh, let's ask you a question, right? So we know that, let's choose the, this problem. Uh, so we know, that, um, we know that this neural network is able to uh, separate these two classes from each other, as we can see visually. Um, I can actually, I can try to decrease my hidden layers to see until what point my system is gonna work, right? So I reduce the hidden layers to, hidden units to three nodes, it still works. And I reduce, let's say I reduce it to two, but it doesn't work anymore. Okay, so what happened? Right? So we know that I lose a little bit of expressivity. This is going back to the question that you asked. Um, we are losing a little bit of expressivity as we are shrinking the number of the nonlinearities. Um, depending on the, nature, on the nature of the problem, we might need more or less nonlinearity. For example, in this case, if you look at how this nonlinearity is visualized, it is each nonlinearity is basically one hyperplane. Right? Um, and this is also hyperplane. Two hyperplanes are not enough to express a circle. But if you have three hyperplanes, they can form a triangle and express the circle. Okay, so this is the intuition that we, have, that we have by just looking at the problem and visualizing it. Right? So if I, if I add three neurons, if I add three neurons here, they're, they're able to form this hyperplane, this hyperplane, and this hyperplane. They form this triangle and they separate it, that circle from what is in the output. Okay, a little bit of intuitive practical comments. One is, uh, as of now, in our theoretical understanding of neural networks, we don't have concrete guarantees on, on its convergence. It's usually a practical problem. Uh, usually we need a lot of training data for training neural networks, especially the ones with lots of parameters. Um, that should be a trivial point because, as you know, um, models with lots of, lots of parameters or lots of nonlinearities, they're overly parameterized and they can overfit to the nature of your problem, right? So let's just try to show that uh, with an example here. Um, let's say I have very few, um, okay, so this, what this control is the ratio of training to test data. I'm gonna use very few training data. As you can see, there's very few training data here. The question is, can this model learn the pattern that uh, there's a circle and there, the rest of the data is in that, like outside? Oh, it does learn it in this case. Let's make it more complicated. Okay, so in this case, it is able to learn it. Maybe it's because the problem is actually not very hard. But it's usually recommended that uh, you, you won't use a lot of training data. Um, and uh, of course, uh, it goes without saying that uh, the more complicated system that you have, you probably need more, more training iterations. Um, and uh, for term termination, you have seen this empirically. Uh, for termination criteria, you have to often like have this held out set and make sure that you're not overfitting on this held out set. And um, something that is, has been observed uh, in a lot of theoretical or empirical work is that these systems, their objective function that you're minimizing is highly nonlinear. There are lots of local minimas. And in order to uh, escape from these, these local minimas, you might need to use different tricks. For example, you can reinitialize the parameters of your neural net uh, in different ways, like lots of random initialization, until one of them minimizes it better. Right? Um, you should be aware of um, overfitting in neural networks. It's not trivial to train neural networks, especially for big problems. 
is usually an empirical problem. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, held out set, validation set is an important for this. Okay. Um, I want to mention uh, something else before we almost wrap up this lecture, and that is the idea of um, dropout. Dropout is a simple idea that has been produced, that people have discussed it in the past maybe 10 years. Dropout is simple, in this, so, and this is the idea. Basically, when I'm, training my training, when I'm training my neural network, I randomly drop and ignore some of the units that I have. You might say, why am I doing this? Because it feels like I'm making the life of my neural net harder by just ignoring some of the units. It's counterintuitive, why would I do that? And the idea is that um, by forcing your neural net to focus um, or distribute its, its focus on different units, and so basically, when, I, when, I, when I'm dropping some of the units, I'm forcing my neural net to focus on some of the units that maybe were not paid attention to uh, before, when this unit was here. So I'm intentionally randomly dropping some of the units with the hope that my neural net is paying attention to the whole structure and I'm being able to train the whole system. And intuitively, um, this actually indeed helps. Um, if you remember, uh, you probably have seen this figure in, the, in other places that your test set, when you're overfitting, works like this. The error on the test set on validation goes down, and when you start to overfit, the error on the test set goes up, right? So this is overfitting. But when you do dropouts, it's usually the case that you empirically observe the error on the validation set, it consistently goes down, and that is the, that is, this is, this is often referred to as implicit regularization. We are implicitly, we are implicitly regularizing the neural network by dropping the units and forcing it to pay attention to other ways that were not paid attention to uh, previously, right? Okay, there, there are theoretical uh, ways to justify this too, but I think we are gonna, uh, we are not gonna, we are gonna skip that part. Okay, um, so this is what, this is all you needed to understand about feedforward neural nets. Um, I understand that there were a bunch of theory stuff, like deriving the update rules for backpropagation that were not very uh, easy to follow in the lectures. But uh, my suggestion is you shouldn't worry too much about knowing and remembering those details. I think what matters is focusing on the big picture and the intuition and how this algorithm works in general, right? And, um, and uh, with that, um, I think I'll see you next time. Uh, if you have questions as to how things work again, feel free to stop by here, up here, and uh, see you on Wednesday. Uh...
Like there, there's also weights uh, that you use in order to update the like. Like you don't apply the gradient directly; you have to add a weight. Depends on like neural networks that become like very sort of demanding in terms of like for each data set, for each application, you will need to tune all these parameters and then make it work, and then so it becomes very context specific. <laughs> so it becomes like exactly so powerful, like, but not like it's not like a plug and play. Um, it's, or is it plug and play? Like it's it, not. It's not. So the state of the field is that 
uh, a lot of people are hired. It's their j day job. They work on tuning neural networks. That's their, and they call it data scientists. So um, that is it. Um, so if you, so if you, if you use a package in Python or R or whatever, and you just run stuff like with some random parameter, like you won't do well. Like you need to really spend time. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, it's definitely not plug and play. It's, uh, you gotta study so much about like even the architecture. Like architecture wise. Um, people have to engineer their architectures, not just parameters, but their parameters so that it fits their thinking. Yeah, because I saw this like a bit, I was looking online, it's just like all these different architectures like RBF and this and deep something or the other and there's like color coding and each node is then doing different things depending on the architecture and so, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is deep learning just like nodes with like more players? <laughs> I think it's for, that's for my dream, man. I mean, at some point it started as with, with that idea. But I'm not sure if anyone is really like, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, but like the idea was that, right? Like, yeah, the layers. Layers. yeah, but like nowadays, whoever says no, I'm like, look, regardless of whether it's deep or not, you can stop this later. <laughs> 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 yeah, so 